Thank you very much for joining us and giving us the time. My pleasure. My first question is, who is Ruth Sharon? Please tell us a little bit about her. You know, that question is so interesting because uh, I could answer my ethnicity, I could answer about my education, I could answer about my travels, I could answer about my interests. But I guess if I had to use just one phrase that would sum up who I am, I would say I'm a citizen of the world. And the aspect of filmmaking and interfaith dialogue, how does that fit in? So those are tools that I developed along the way to communicate as a citizen of the world. And I, I first was a journalist and a still photographer, and then I felt that that wasn't enough. I, wanted, I felt I wanted to be moving my camera all the time, so I became a filmmaker. And although I worked on feature films, when I was younger, I still felt that the documentary world was uh, probably the closest to what I wanted to discover and explore, and that's where people's stories, wherever I went in the world, I was really interested in people, how they lived, what they thought, how they loved, what mattered to them. And because I spent a year and a half in Latin America when I was in my early 20s, and I visited 19 countries and 54 cities and lived with families wherever I went, I was exposed to people's lives in an intimate way that most people never have a chance to see. So it's, it's really fascinating to me how we, how we develop our differences and then how we distinguish them and how then we behave towards people as a result of sometimes what is nothing more than artifice and not really who we are. Talk about your documentaries. Today I'm a rabbi. That's an interesting... Uh uh, subject that you chose. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I went to the ordination ceremony of three women who were all in their 50s who had dreamed their entire life of becoming rabbis but society had told them otherwise that they couldn't be. But as things started shifting within Judaism in, in conservative and, and reform Judaism, more liberal Judaism in the last 20-30 uh, years, women have become rabbis. But these three women were not young. They were in their 50s, and they were realizing their life dream. And after I made the film, I showed it to people who were of different ages, men and women, and from different religious backgrounds, and everybody cried when they saw the film. And I was trying to, that sort of puzzled me, but what I, what I came to eventually was that human beings want to realize themselves, whatever their profession or whatever they choose, that is important to them. And when they can't do it, when something in society holds them back and they're frustrated, they live a life with regrets and just in, in wanting. But these three women, including one who was the first Moroccan-born female rabbi in the whole world, coming from nine generations of male rabbis, when they realize their dream and when we witness someone realizing their dream, we all are inspired. And so that's why people cried, because it wasn't just about becoming a rabbi, it was about having a dream and then fulfilling it. So in Judaism, what you're saying is that women couldn't, could not become rabbis and now the trend has changed. Well, only in more liberal Judaism, because among the Orthodox Jews, women can still not be rabbis. But something interesting has happened recently. In New York City, uh, a woman was made head of an Orthodox Jewish community, and that is a departure, and a significant departure. And there are many modern Orthodox Jews who believe that women will be rabbis even in Orthodoxy eventually. It's just a question of time. But do you think it's acceptable? Like, I mean, uh, is it allowed eventually that women can do that? I, I'm making a, a strange statement here, but just out of curiosity, because I know in, in Islam, women cannot lead prayers. And I know there's a, in the women's circles, there is a talk about that. Why can't they do that? I. It's, I'm really glad you asked me that because last weekend I was in New York City and I covered and filmed, documented the WISE conference, which brought together 150 outstanding Muslim women from all over the world. And one of the things that they're planning to do within Islam, without leaving Islam and without, uh, how should I say, violating the laws of Islam, is they're going to find ways for women to become spiritual leaders, which would eventually include leading prayers or giving a sermon. Now you say, how is that possible? Well, every major religion has had reformation. And people who were involved as Catholics 
at some point who really, women who wanted to become priests and couldn't, may have left and they went to the Episcopalian Church where today they do have priests. As a matter of fact, a woman was just appointed the first bishop of the Episcopalian Church in America and there was huge press around it. So what does that mean? It's not what I or you think. There is a, a surge that's going on and I believe, I call it the underground revolution. The women's underground revolution. Yes, it is. And what's happening is that women are moving in a way that they understand that they can also be important leaders alongside of men, not replacing, not instead of, but alongside of men. And actually that revelation led me to start work on a new series called Breaking the Heavenly Glass Ceiling. Okay, uh, let's talk about your latest project the most intriguing <laughs> of them all, at least in my uh, perspective. God and Allah need to talk. Uh, what is that about? You know, people say sometimes God speaks to you in a small, still voice, and sometimes God uses other means. Well, God used a billboard to talk to me. I actually saw that. God and Allah need to talk on a huge billboard at the corner of Sunset and and uh, Hollywood, uh, Sunset and, and uh, Hollywood Street in Hollywood, California. And I was so disturbed by it that I pulled my car over to the side of the road. And um, I sat there thinking to myself, this is crazy. What does, why, why are God and Allah separated? And I drove home and for three days and three nights I thought about that billboard. And I decided I had to go back and film it because I decided that moment I was going to make a film to show that God and Allah are the same thing and that we have separated God. God is not separate. We have divided God. And it was a result of 9-11 and people's fears and, and the inability to see beyond current events to see God as a unity, not as separate. Do you think we need to talk to God or Allah rather than both of them talking to each other? They're, God and Allah are always talking to each other. They're the same thing. It's just a different way of addressing God. You know, you know it's remarkable that w in the interfaith work I've done, one of the people that I met was an uh, Egyptian Jew. He was born and raised in Cairo. And his in entire life, until he left Egypt, he spoke Arabic. And when he and his family referred to God, they referred to Allah. They didn't refer to the Hebrew name for God, which there are many of them he always referred to Allah. So for him, God, there is no difference. Now, why do we see difference? And the person who wrote that billboard, I tracked him down. I wanted to know what led him to, to put that up. And he just felt that something had happened to our society, that there was this schism, and there was a schizophrenia in our society, but instead of us recognizing it was in us, we attributed it to God. So some Muslims were afraid to come to see the film and called me and said, are you going to show that God and Allah are separate? I said, I promise you, no, I'm going to prove the exact opposite in the film. And I think the Muslim community has really embraced this film very warmly because they see themselves as, like everybody else, they see themselves as mothers, fathers, people, and not as a stereotype and not as a monolithic group. So uh, the, the film title then was provocative, but I used it intentionally because I wanted to show where we were from a psychological point of view after 9-11. The, the title is definitely provocative and I'm sure the film is too, but the, the, I'm sure there, there must have been an inspiration at the back of your mind somewhere prior to watching that billboard. Where did that inspiration actually come from? Well, the material I filmed was not for this film. I had been working on another project for, for close to 15 years about the holiday of Passover and how it's celebrated by people from different faiths. And I uncovered the most extraordinary Passover seders, which is the feast that's celebrated every spring to commemorate when the Israelites were slaves and left Egypt and they were uh, liberated and that they received the Ten Commandments in, in the desert. So I had uh, filmed seders in prison that were celebrated by Muslims, Christians, and Jews. I filmed satyrs of um, battered women, satyrs of the gay and lesbian community, satyrs of the Catholic workers, and I just kept hearing about all these amazing satyrs, and I realized that the holiday of Passover has the seeds to 
of universality because the fight for freedom is everyone's fight. It's not just the, the ancient Israelites. Everybody has issues. And whether it's political or economic or psychological or whatever it is, we all are fighting for freedom in some way. So that material that I had filmed, which was the first one was at the Islamic Center, they had invited the larger community of Los Angeles to come after 9-11 and to help celebrate Ashura, the Muslim holiday, which is, has two, fact, two components to it. One has to do with the Battle of Karbala, right? But the other has to do with when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he saw the Jews of Medina celebrating Passover and he asked them what they were doing and they told him, he said, oh, he said, I am close to Moses and I will now celebrate this holiday too. So Ashura, which is actually a Muslim holiday, has within it the seeds of the Jewish practice. So they invited people from all over LA to come. And because it had to do with Passover, I went there and I filmed that. And then three weeks later, the uh, Muslim and Jewish community of Los Angeles organized a Seder, a Muslim interfaith Seder of Reconciliation. And it was just what was needed at that moment. And so all these wonderful people from the Muslim and Jewish community came with Christian guests, and they had the, the Passover Seder in which was to reconcile the silence between Ishmael and Isaac. In other words, they were saying definitively, we are the, all from Abraham, we're the children of Abraham, and we need to find a way to communicate. And I don't know whether you're familiar, I don't know whether this is true in Islam, but in Judaism, Ishmael and Isaac bury their father Abraham together, and they make peace in the Bible. So they did it, we can do it. And what's really fascinating is that after I finished the film, I added another seven minutes a, a, a year and a half later because the following year they had another Seder, but the Christians who had been present were so profoundly affected by that event that they wanted to become organizers. So it shows how when you do an interfaith event, it doesn't matter how many people are there, when you invite other guests and so forth, there's a good chance that you will be able to create a movement. You know, like when they say when you throw a pebble into the pond and you start to have concentric circles. So that's what happened. So the next year, the event was even bigger. And the Christians were not guests. They were co-organizers. One of the things that we've seen uh, as far as the youth of America are concerned is this uh, subliminal hatred towards Islam. And in retrospect, we've seen the same uh, as far as the young Muslim youths of the developing world are, are, are concerned. Do you think the film can play a role somewhere there in educating youth on both sides of the, of the world, in the developing world and in the developed world, that we're talking about the same God, it's just one God? Well, I have been on many college campuses with this film, and that's my favorite place to take this film. And I make a deal with the people who invite me if it's the chaplain or the dean of religion or whoever it is, I say, I will come and I will do an interfaith program and I'll bring musicians and I'll show the film and we'll have interactive dialogue and I'll do all that on one condition, that something has to happen when I leave. I'm not coming here to make you feel warm and fuzzy or to make you feel comfortable. I want everybody who attends to feel at the end that they, he and she personally, can do something to change the world. And young people have that cap capacity, especially now with internet and all the connections that have been made. Young people have the capacity to change other people's minds quickly. And so I think that if we set that as a standard for behavior, that we don't come together, it's good to come and break bread together and have a good time and so forth. And I'm not, I'm not discounting that. And interfaith dialogue is good too. But I think there have to be several elements in place to really move beyond, again, the concentric circles. And so bringing musicians in from like at uh, the Embassy of Bangladesh, we're going to have a Jewish and a Bangladeshi Muslim, actually he's Catholic, musician play music together from two different cultures because that immediately is a living example of what we're trying to do in our dialogue. And then there'll be people from the interfaith community and the, and the congressional community and the diplomatic community. And what we want to do is we want to invite them to expand the work that they've been doing. And to not only that, but you know, we, when we talk about major cities in Los Angeles, we have interfaith events 
every, almost every weekend now. When I started doing this work 15 years ago, we'd have one every six months. Now, sometimes we have two and three activities on the same day. That's wonderful. But these are major cities. But America is not just made of major <laughs> cities. And so there are many places around America where there are no interfaith commissions or alliances or activities. And what I would like the Congress people to do is to realize that leadership from the top down is as important as grassroots from the bottom up. And if they go back to their hometowns and their states and they see that they don't have an interfaith commission, then they need to say, this is the most important thing we have to do right now. We need to make sure that, and even if it's a homogeneous uh, constituency, because some people don't do interfaith work because everybody looks like them and sounds like them. But we, this is, this is a, not just a national problem, this is a global problem. And I believe, really with all my heart, and that's probably why I'm doing this work, is that interfaith work is the most important work on the globe today. And so I feel that everything that you and I can do to advance the cause and to have people begin to see us as a community, a global community, will be one way to prevent so many wars because otherwise we're in deep trouble. Uh, b besides Oklahoma bombings, the other terrorist attacks in America were caused by people outside America. How would you address those who don't want to listen to you? who do not believe in interfaith dialogue and who believe in the hatred that they have developed? You know, that question comes up a lot. And I can't change the mind of a, an extremist. And you know, there are extremists in every religion. No religion is exempt from extremism. But it's up to the mainstream people within the religion to set the tone. And more and more, for example, when at the beginning after 9-11, many people were saying, well, why, are, why isn't the Muslim community speaking out against terror? Why aren't they mobilizing? Why aren't they this? Well, you know what? I think everybody was in shock. But I've been receiving online so many letters and so many articles from Muslim publications denouncing terror and saying this is not what Islam is and this is not the future of Islam. So what I see happening now, and this is, for example, the event at the embassy is a perfect example. The ambassador who is Muslim of a country that is Muslim and Hindu decided to take on this event and to invite the entire interfaith community to come and participate. Why? Because even a tiny country like Bangladesh, right, although it's densely populated and it's maybe not well known by the rest of the world, even one small country can have an enormous effect on the whole world. They would, they would like to be peace brokers for the world, and I say, why not? And look, we started planning this event seven, eight months ago, and recently a Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to a Bangladeshi, right? Uh, Mohammed Yunus, right? And so it seemed like, for me, it was like God speaking again. That's right. You go, Bangladesh. You do it, because you have the potential to change the world. But why did you choose the Embassy of Bangladesh in particular for the film screening and for the event? You know, it's, this, is what, this is what's so fascinating about interfaith work. You never know who your co-conspirator is going to be. You never know. You go to an event, you meet someone, and you, dis you discover you have a similar interest, and then you say, let's, let's do something together. I met the Ambassador uh, Chowdhury, His Excellency, about a year ago at a reception for him in Los Angeles. Now, why, why, did I, why was I there? Because uh, my friend Omar Huda, a uh, Muslim friend from Bangladesh, the first Bangladeshi I ever knew my whole life, we, we had become very good friends. We went to interfaith events together. We corresponded online. And he wrote me an email saying, the ambassador from my country is coming for reception. I'm inviting you to come and meet him. It was as simple as that. And then there was a meeting of the minds, and, and he was eager and to, to have Bangladesh assume a more important role as a peace broker, and it was just a natural fit, and that's why. If I had met an ambassador from another country who was interested, I would have done that too. I'm, I'm not a diplomat, and I don't travel in diplomatic circles, but here again is an example of what I call citizen diplomacy, right? Every, you, every person in the world can be a citizen diplomat. And what does that mean? It means that when you meet someone and you have an opportunity to advance the cause of peace or interfaith harmony, whatever, you simply say, let's do something together. Would you uh, 
you know, utilizing this platform right now, would you invite the government of Pakistan, the ambassador of Pakistan, and the people of Pakistan to organize an interfaith event in Pakistan and in America with you? Well, I'm going to look right in the camera and say that. I invite the ambassador of Pakistan, the people of Pakistan, and all the Pakistanis who are here in America to join in this effort. I have heard so much about your country. I have at least 80 good friends in Los Angeles and Pakistan, and I want to encourage all the Pakistanis who care about doing this work to join me in having an interfaith event in the future. There, you heard it directly from the horse's mouth. <laughs> and now they have to come, otherwise, you know, they're missing out. Uh, uh, a couple of questions more. Uh, you mentioned about a quick guide on how to organize interfaith events and you have this process. Could you, would you like to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, sure, I would. I would because maybe someone will listening will try it then, okay? I'm sure. It's, like a, it's not like where they say, don't try this at home. Try this at home, okay? So it's basically five steps, all right? And when I go to universities, I very often uh, model it and teach it because I think if someone is, participates in it and sees how it's organized and what the order of things are, then they can go and duplicate it. So it's not, you know, it's like interfaith events for dummies, you know, like they have all these books. Well, this, you don't, it's not about dummies. It's about simply, it's just very straightforward. The first part, part one is networking and refreshments. Food is always included. Why? Something about breaking bread, something about sharing food with people from another culture immediately creates uh, congeniality and warmth. You know, it's just, it's just a fact of nature. And the truth is that most people <clears throat> love to invite people to their homes and to be hosts. And most people also like to be invited. So that's number one. The second part is music. I always have more than one musician with me who plays music from various, they play music from various cultures and very often I ask them to create something together that, again, is the example of what we're trying to do with our dialogue. So musicians never have problems in playing together, but people have problems in talking to each other. And it's so they, they get to see the example of how two people with different upbringings, different musical educations, right, different skills come together and they play beautiful music together. And it does something else. There's, um, there's a frequency that's created in the room which opens people's heart when they hear music. It doesn't happen with dialogue, but somehow it happens with music. I don't know whether you know, but in Berlin every year, they have a million people come to Berlin and they have music played. It's called a love fest or whatever. And for one solid week, people are in the street listening to music. Most of them can't speak to each other. There is no one international language except for music. So there is something about vibrationally that opens people's hearts. And then after their hearts have been opened, right, then what I do is I introduce the film, and it doesn't have to be my film. It can be any film that will touch the subject of interfaith work. So in my case, because I made the film and I find that it's helpful, I show it. But sometimes I would show someone else's film too. So that's, we're up to three, right? Then the next thing that I always do is I ask people to interact with each other. I divide them into groups of three to five people. And even if the chairs aren't movable, even if it's in an auditorium, they can turn around and they can create small groups like pods, you know, right? And I ask them to tell everybody in that group what they experienced while they were watching the film. What moved them? What stood out the most? What did they think about in their own lives? Okay? So that's four. That's the entire part. And then the last part, which is probably the most important part, and it's the part where people who do interfaith work generally never tread there because they're afraid to. And what is, what is it? It's asking people to make a commitment. So that's what it means to be an activist, right? It's, it's not just to bring people together to create a feeling of harmony and, and you know, unity. It's that before they go home, they understand that they have to take what just happened to them and then they have to do something. And I give them an example from nature and from physics, which helps them understand why I think everyone can make a difference in the world. This is a true law of physics. If you raise your little finger like that, just that movement, all the molecules in the rest of the world 
have to rearrange themselves around that movement. Wow. So that means if each of one of us is a molecule, right, we can do one small profound act which could reverberate around the world. And then I say to them, what can you do that you haven't done before? And I, I use the, uh, I coined the expression interfaith Pilates. What is it? It's a stretch. I'm asking you to do a stretch. And how do you know it's a stretch? Well, like, just like when you're exercising, if you don't feel a little bit uncomfortable, right, you know that you haven't stretched your muscle. So I'm asking you to get uncomfortable, but take on something that's doable, that you can do, doesn't have to be large scale. It can be large scale if you've been doing this work for a long time and you want to raise the bar, right? But, but for most people, it could mean something as simple as visiting a mosque for the first time if they've never been to a mosque. It could mean uh, something like inviting your co-worker out to lunch who's from a different religion and who you've been suspicious of because you don't really know what he thinks, what he believes. It could mean organizing a small group of people to come over to your house and do something for the community, but you make sure that everybody at that meeting is from a different faith. So in the end, you're not really trying to convince anybody about what you believe. You're doing something for someone else or another group of people. So I'll give you a good example. The Progressive Jewish Alliance in Los Angeles has a group, interfaith group that meets together, and they have young male professionals that meet together once a month. And so one time they decided to go to downtown LA, uh, to the inner city, and to donate blood together. And so they became blood brothers in that act. And I said, it wasn't talking about Judaism or Islam, it was about doing something that both religions think is important. Charity is a very, very important element, both in Islam and in Judaism and in Christianity and all religions. So it was, again, you take something that's sacred and important to all the religions, and then you create an activity in which people can participate. And when they do it, they feel good. And when someone feels good about himself or herself, the chances are they'll do more things like that. So you want to give them a chance to be successful. So that's the final of the five points. It's the call to action. And it's asking people, in some cases, I'll ask them to stand up and say what they're committed to do. And many people will volunteer, and some people will think of really original ideas that I haven't thought of. And that's, that's the, the part where you get uh, beyond just interfaith dialogue. When people start inputting and imagining what they could do to make a difference, and when they feel empowered, because you know it's like raising money, I asked uh, one of the most uh, successful fundraisers about 10 years ago, how does he get money? I said, what, can you just tell me briefly what you do? He said, oh, it's very simple. He said, I just ask people to take out their checkbook. And then I say to them, now write a check. So in interfaith work, what usually happens is you bring people together and you talk and you listen to people's ideas and maybe you feel the same way that you did as when you came and then you go home. But when you go to an event where something is to expect it of you, when you're asked to move forward out of your comfort zone, but to do something which is doable, not insurmountable, you get a sense of empowerment. And it, once you've done it, then you can share it with other people. And once you've shared that with other people, you know what, what the tipping point is? Have you heard that expression? So we don't need the whole world. That's why I don't deal with the extremists. And that's why I can't talk to them. And, and I have listened to them, but I don't try to convince them. I'm interested in getting people who are sitting on the fence or people who have wanted to do something and didn't know what to do and saying to them one simple, profound act, raising your little finger, changing the molecules around you. Uh, you always knew that you would be a filmmaker and an advocate for interfaith dialogue or it just happens part of the moment? <laughs> That's true. You know what's so funny about this is because I remembered recently that when I was in my 20s, I had uh, uh, a yoga teacher of mine do my horoscope, right? And he told me something which I had forgotten. He told me this like 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, he told me this. He said that in, you will, when, you are in a, when you are older, you know, after you've done many things and so forth and traveled, you will travel around the world speaking about religion. And I laughed. I thought, I thought this was a bad reading and I have to pay him for this too. It meant nothing to me at the time because I was, you know, I was 
active in my own faith and I, and I read a lot of things and I was interested, but it just had no meaning for me at all. But I think what happened is that as a result of living in many different countries and meeting people of different faiths uh, and seeing the problems that were generated as a result of religious discord, mostly based on ignorance, mostly based on ignorance, it's amazing to see the similarities between the religions and what are the most profoundly held values. They are so similar. And yet, why is it that we have such a hard time with each other? Why is it that we're killing each other? I can't imagine that God slash Allah is happy about his children behaving that way. I can't imagine that's what God had in mind for us. But if you look at Adam's two kids, that's what they did to each other. They killed each other just just like that. Well, you mean between uh, Cain, Cain and, and Abel? Abel? Yeah. I mean, we st our humankind have started off as extremists. Don't you think we'll end like that? Well, you know, in my study and my understanding through the Jewish tradition, what's been explained to me is that our sages say that God, in giving us free will, gave us the possibility to lead good lives or gave us the possibility to what's in Hebrew, the word for sin is actually chet, which means to miss the mark. You know, it's about not being able to do the good, and so we miss the mark. And those, the stories of the Bible, the reason that they're still fresh and relevant and why we keep making films about them every year is because it really describes human nature. And so we see around us those possibilities, and then it's up to us to see how do we want to be Cain, who says, am I my brother's keeper? Do we want to be, uh, let's say, uh, Joseph, who after being sold into slavery by his brothers and rising to the next to highest position in Egypt and saving the Egyptian people from starvation, right? And seeing his brothers and knowing that they had sold him into slavery was able to forgive them. So these, these are human stories, and we love these stories because it's really about all of us. And yet the Bible shows us what is, and, the, and, and also the Quran and, you know, and the New Testament, it's all about how can we behave. Now, what we do is our choice, and as long as we have choice, we're going to see evil as well as good. So, you know, which, who's going to be your role model from the Bible? My second last question, critics would argue not that I would want to say that, but criti critics would argue that, uh, you know, does she, the, uh, does she really want to do this or is she trying to sell her film? What would you, oh. <laughs> what would you say about that? Uh, you know, how, how do you address your critics who would not, might have seen the film even and would say that Ruth is just trying to promote her project and, you know, there's nothing, no, there's no interfaith dialogue involved here. Well, when I decided to premiere the film in Los Angeles, I created around the film an entire program in which my film was only maybe one-eighth of the whole premiere. And we had keynote speakers that included Congresswoman Diane Watson, Sheriff Lee Baca, the mayor of Hollywood. We had representatives from the Muslim, Jewish, and Christian community scholars who spoke. We had five different musical groups that performed from all over the world. Uh, and the journalist from the Jewish Journal asked me this question, why are you doing this? Why don't you just show your film? So that's my answer to you, because if it was just about my film, then I could just enter it in film festivals and sell it online. But for me, the film is, is really a vehicle. It's not even about the film. The film gives me a chance to have people see what the problem is and to view Muslims in a way that they're not used to seeing them. And after the, perform after the premiere, I had Muslim participants in the audience come up and kiss my hand and cry and say, thank you for, sh you know, thank you for showing us as who we are. And what do you see? What does that mean who we are? They're varied, like the flowers in the field. They come from all over the world. Muslims are not one group. They happen to be called Muslims, but there are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. They look every, every way that everybody looks in the world. They're no different than, any, than Christians or Jews or, or other religions. 
they're uh, so varied, and even their political views are varied, and even the way they practice their religion is varied. So when people start to see Muslims as individuals and make choices based on the individual and not the group, then, then I feel that I've done my work. And whether my film is shown or not shown, I, I, there are places where I speak about interfaith where I don't show my film at all. I just share my views about doing this work. So it just, it's, it's, it's an aid, it's a vehicle and it's a help to me. And um, what I hope is that I won't have to be showing it so much. I hope that, <laughs> that the work will take off in such a way that the film won't be necessary. But as long as, see, for me, film is an expression of the arts. I can't imagine doing this work without the arts being included. And I tell every community, support your artists. They're our lifeblood. I think that the arts have a special way of reaching people that talk can't have. And as a matter of fact, I have a, I'm have just saying this for the first time publicly. I have a new campaign. And maybe someone out there will hear this and will help me with this. I would like to have music played at the UN, both in New York and Geneva, before every general session. I would like the musicians who play before to represent more than one culture. I would like them to be on a rotation wheel where they would come and they would, you know, sign up and they would all through the year, there would be two to three musicians every time playing. And again, to set the stage, to, to, to create a frequency where after that, when there is deliberation and talk, people are open to it. They don't come like this with, you know, the idea. Literally of United opens. Nations. Yeah. Are you, are you satisfied with the work uh, of the governments uh, as far as American government, Pakistani government, Indian government, governments of the Middle East? Are you satisfied with their work as far as interfaith dialogue is concerned? No. Why? I, I th are they helping yeah. their people educate about, learn about interfaith? I don't, you know, if they were, I think that there would be a different world today. If textbooks included the honoring the different faiths and cultures of the world, if, peop if children were not taught to hate in their textbooks, um, if governments created interfaith commissions that would be as important as a commission on you know, civil rights, human rights, water and sewage, it's really, what message is the government delivering? Now I know we have here, Karen Hughes is the Under Secretary of State for Public Policy and also she heads the interfaith section and, and that is fantastic. I think that when a government says that this department represents an ideal and a goal and a need of the population, then people in the, in the, you know, outside of the government say this is important. But beyond having the department, we have to make sure that the government now is a role model in what they're doing, not just having the department, but what is the government really doing and how does it view its cultures. You know, Los Angeles, we say all the time, is like a petri dish for the world. We have so many cultures there, so many ethnicities. And if we can succeed there, and we have a, a mayor now who is so interested in interfaith, and we have an amazing sheriff, Sheriff Lee Baca, who has been doing interfaith work for years before it was even popular as a concept. So as long as the officials are aware of what this really means, and I want to share something with you that Sheriff Baca taught me when a group of us, interfaith group, went to, to see him and to ask for his advice and counsel and so forth, and he said, make sure when you do this work that you do two things that you celebrate and that you have fun. Don't do this work unless celebration and fun are part of it. And so the truth is, it doesn't have to be uh, an obligation to do interfaith work. It should be a joy. It should be something where we really get to appreciate one another. And the best way to do that when you're starting out is to find ways to go to people's homes and communities when they're having a, a religious celebration and be part of the celebration eat their food with them and find out why they're celebrating and why, why is this day special to them. And then invite them to your home or to your synagogue or church or mosque when you're doing something because during Ramadan now, Ramadan has become synonymous with interfaith work around the country. Why? It never used to be an interfaith holiday. But you know what? 
the Muslims of America understood that they wanted to share something that is so special to them. And once you share Ramadan, it's not just the food. It's the idea that before you get to the food, you've spent an entire day fasting. And it's not just that day. I mean, it's an entire month of fasting. So what value does that communicate? What's going on in the person who's taken on that commitment? That's the way you transfer and, and convey values. And so now the people who come to celebrate Ramadan, they don't just come for good food. They know that their hosts have not eaten since sunrise, right? And in many cases, there are now communities where, where they will prepare the meal for their Muslim friends so that when they come off of their fast, they will be in someone else's home as guests. Interfaith activists like myself, every, from time to time we do a, a check-in and we say, you know, are we really making a difference? Does this count at all? Does, are people behaving differently? Is the world a different place as a result of what we're doing? And so, you know, we, we're asking the Almighty, is this really what you want me to do? It's, so we, we say this, two things. Number one is take right action and don't worry about the results, okay? Because if you're only looking at the results and the results aren't forthcoming immediately, you can get discouraged and you say, oh, you know what, this isn't working. So you just, you know what you have to do and you do it. And the other thing is a beautiful saying from Pirkei Avot, which in Hebrew means the sayings of our fathers. And it goes like this. Uh, it's not upon you to finish the work, but neither can you desist from it. So we're all standing on the shoulders of someone that came before us. And in this work, we're planting seeds. You know, we, that's, in some cases, that's all we get to do. We may not even see the fruit that comes out of that. But we can't say, because we're not going to see the fruit or taste the fruit, that we can't do the work. Beautiful. Uh, last question. Where do you go from here? What happens next? Will you continue to make films, continue to dialogue as far as interfaith is concerned without waiting for the fruits to come out, without having a bite of the fruit, without knowing will it succeed or not? Will you still continue? Well, <clears throat> every once in a while I get a letter from someone who participated in an interfaith event where that person was changed or something took place or they organized something or did something. And those are my pearls. Or is it, those are my rosary beads in a way, if you know what I mean. So as long as, as long as I can get some kind of feedback like that or I can see differences that in, at USC, University of Southern California, I did this program uh, two years ago where I brought the film and we did the interactive part and call action. And, and the Dean of Religion, Rabbi Susan Lemley, agreed with me before we started that they would start an interfaith group of students. Muslim, Christian, and Jewish students. It was called Rapport. And today that group became so successful and powerful that it was integrated into a larger group which now meets once a week. And they're still doing activities together. So as long as, as, long as there are opportunities to do this kind of work and as long as we're in a state where I've, I feel this work needs to be done, my heart is in it. You know, I sometimes joke around and say I'm an interfaith junkie. What does that mean? We all laugh. Those of us who do interfaith work is that, you know, we just, we hear about something. I was invited uh, next weekend to participate in a uh, conference on oneness in Pasadena, California. And the following weekend is the Unity University Peace Sunday. So every weekend something's going on and, and we go there. We go there like people who go to horse races, you know. We go to see who are the players. We go to see who's talking. We go to see who's come that time, who hasn't come before. And it's, and it's very exciting. In terms of film work, uh, I mentioned the new series I'm working on about women, spiritual and religious leaders. Uh, I honestly believe that what will make a huge difference in the next hundred years will be the women of the world. And what I see happening, and this is, and I'm seeing it in many religions, is that women are moving forward and they're becoming empowered to say to the men from their groups and from their religions, saying, we, we have an equal share with you we want to make a difference with you. We want you to be our partners, and we want you to allow us to be all that we can be. And I think that, as I've seen now happening in Islam with, with progressive 
moderate Muslim women and men who are getting together and forming a coalition and doing something together as a group. And I've seen it in Christianity, and certainly I've seen it in Judaism. I think this is catching on, and I believe, and maybe this is because I'm a woman and I'm prejudiced about that, but I believe that the women of the world will make such an important contribution when we are full and equal citizens with men and partners with men that the world will look like a different place. And I think that the men will be better men when they allow us to be the best women we can be. And on that note, I thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.